Hello again. Today's chapter from my book, Philosophizer's Bible, is called The Reckoning, and it's about academic philosophy, but in particular, two people who taught me, who sadly, subsequently committed suicide. And you can guess that this had a big effect on me. I've already made a video on this, and in fact, um, this is the second of the two chapters where I borrowed from uh, previous writing or previous videoing. Um, it was necessary to deal with this, and I will say a bit more about these two people in a later chapter as well. So they were Jerry Cohen and Ian McFetridge, lecturers at Birkbeck College, University of London. And I should just explain that in the UK we talk about lecturers, in America you'd call them professors, but here um, a professor is something you become after several steps up the academic ladder. You don't get to be a professor straight away. They were lecturers. And we had a very young and dynamic um, department. Another of the people who taught me was Roger Scruton, who is now like one of the leading lights in conservative thinking. And it's really interesting that some of the most important um, ideas that I got about ethics and politics, um, ethical philosophy, political philosophy, were from both Jerry, who was a Marxist, and Roger Scruton, who was from the right. Jerry recommended Marx's 1844 manuscripts and an essay by Herbert Marcuse called On Hedonism which is really incredible um, as a way of reading Plato's Gorgias, which deals with that topic. And Roger Scruton recommended Nietzsche, <laughs> fantastic works of Nietzsche, and F.H. Bradley, his ethical studies. And you put all that together, you get quite a, an incredible mix. But Jerry was, um, there were two Jerry Cohen's actually, and they were both Marxists, which is confusing. The other Jerry Cohen was at University College, London. But our Jerry Cohen was rather quiet. He didn't seem totally happy in his job. And he left eventually. I don't know whether he was kicked out or he left voluntarily. But some time later, this was after I'd left Birkbeck College, he was found in a hut. Um, in the woods outside Los Angeles, and he'd been there for months, rotting away, his body had been rotting away. So the presumption was he killed himself. I mean, it's possible he'd had a heart attack or something. Ian McFetridge was um, an analytic philosopher. He was into the works of Russell and Frege, Wittgenstein, and uh, he was very excitable, um, quite nervous. And I have to say, it was a, he would have been the very last person I would have thought would, would have topped himself, but he did. And again, this was after I left. And it got me thinking, what is it? These were young men who had their lives ahead of them, much, much younger than I am. You know, I mean, you know, they, they were in their 20s. You know, they, as I said, it was a very young department. Why would they do that? Why would they give up all hope? And I've come to the conclusion that it has something to do with academic philosophy, the worm in the apple of academic philosophy, as I explain in this chapter. And I'm not saying, you know, obviously everyone who is driven to this extreme, if their story is unique, their story is, is different. You know, no two suicides have the same explanation. I mean, if you really get to know what was going on. But nevertheless, I think that the fact they were academic philosophers or striving to be academic philosophers had something not a little to do with it. So, so I, it's a kind of a warning, and this is what I mean by the reckoning. For anyone who contemplates this career, I'm not saying it's a bad career, I'm not saying there aren't many who are very, very happy in it. Um, but there are dangers. This is for you, academic philosophers. 
I want to look at an episode from the past, from decades back, that is still very painful to me. It's something I have to do, something I promised myself I would do if I had the chance. The opening description is not of me, although my, in my imagination I can easily put myself in that person's shoes. I was actually there. I see you, ghosts from my past. The description I'm going to give is of some university philosophy teacher somewhere. It could be anywhere in the world. They're all the same now, aren't they? Regardless of the language or even the culture. Everywhere egg boxes are springing up with little cubicles, each one containing a professional academic diligently working away, adding to the already gigantic pile of books and articles, and more books and more articles. Just for the record, I've never owned my own black telephone with a row of buttons, I never had my name on the door. I mean, the times that I did teach in the University of Sheffield, there's probably, there was probably a piece of paper stuck with sellotape, and that was my name on the door, <laughs> but um, not permanently. But you have, haven't you? Let's not quib quibble about the colour of the telephone. You know exactly what I'm talking about. This is about someone, actually two different men that I knew personally, although the tragic denouement was the same in each case. Someone who has set his career on making a success in the academic world and is beginning to question, too late it seems, whether success as others judge it was worth the price you had to pay. Was it what you imagined when you started off on your journey all those years ago? Was that what you wanted? What did you think it would be like? Why hasn't philosophy changed my life? You gasp at the absurdity of a question that seemingly came from nowhere. You don't know whether to laugh or cry. It's Monday morning. Pale February sunlight trickles through a loose second floor window pane that rattles whenever a bus or lorry goes past. On your desk, a disorderly pile of ungraded assignments threatens to topple onto the floor. You came in especially to do this, to catch up. No lectures or tutorials today. You snuck past the departmental secretary when she was on the phone. No one even knows you're here. The time is yours. On the landing outside, you can hear the muffled sounds of a conversation. I heard Williamson's giving a paper on skepticism at the joint session. Any idea what it's about? Don't ask me. I don't know. Laughter. Then quiet. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Years of study to get to where you are now. To be sitting here. Black telephone with an extra row of buttons. Your name on the door. And yet it seems as if your life is in the same place it always was. Outwardly conventional, yet inwardly directionless, directionless and confused. By a roundabout route, you're back where you started. Searching for meaning where there is none. You didn't know that then, but you do now. Last week an email arrived saying that your latest article had been accepted by a middle rank philosophy journal. The news hardly raised a smile. Once you would have been overjoyed, you would have bought everyone in the department a drink. That was then, but this is now. When did the change happen? You've come to realise that your best efforts, the very best you can give, will be all but forgotten a few decades from now. Consigned to a footnote, you will be forgotten. Into your head come the words from the band Pink Floyd, another brick in the wall. Could you have been more? Maybe, or maybe not. One thing you do know for certain is that nothing is going to happen today. The assignments will remain unmarked. You're going to sit and wait Watch the patch of sunlight creep along the far wall, along the faded titles in your bookcase. Wait for who knows what thoughts to come. I was wondering what I would say to that unnamed academic, gloomily watching a patch of sunlight creep along the office wall. Then the words of the Paul Simon song came to me. Sneak out the back. Make a new plan. No need to be coy. 
walk out. Don't ever come back. Just set yourself free. It's so easy. You don't need this. Start again. Start a new life. But that's exactly what you did, Jerry. They found your body in a remote, remote wooden hut in the forest outside Los Angeles. You had lain there rotting away for months. Escaping isn't enough. You need a good plan. I'm just going to sit here and think about it isn't enough. Ian, you couldn't see any way out even though it was right in front of you. You were too clever for your own good. You saw through Jerry's easy non-escape. Of course this is all wrong. Because I'm talking about this as if it's just a matter of thinking or reasoning. You can't think or reason yourself out of deep depression. No, but if you have the wit to realise that you're going through a serious mental crisis, that any thoughts that come to you are distorted by your condition, not to be trusted, certainly not to be acted upon, then there are steps you can take, steps to get help. And this is my case against philosophy. Being a professional philosopher is a permanently distorting mental condition. You come to believe that whatever the fix, the power of reason alone can get you out of this somehow. And if you can't see a way, that's down to your weakness, your incapacity of the think as a thinker. So wrong. Then again, I can't talk because I've never taken that fateful step of going for help. Never needed to. And I know the icy deceptive tentacles of depression well enough. Who doesn't? When backed against a wall, I've always somehow found a way out. I'm smart enough, but I'm no genius. Resourcefulness is my strongest suit. Then again, finding a way out is not that difficult to do when you're not reliant on a salary, when you don't give two hoots about what others will say if you go AWOL. Resourcefulness and maybe more than a small dose of echidism. We're all different, right? I look after myself. I'm making myself better. That's what a philosophizer does. I am the motorcycle I'm working on, to use Persick's happy phrase. As I once wrote, I've been made to feel guilty by crippled, ma crippled manipulators who could find no other way to make up for their own inadequacy by bombastic pedants and critics with hypertrophic moral consciences. But my conscience is clear. That was in my blog, Hedgehog Philosopher. Don't listen to the others. Ignore them. Don't let their self-serving, asinine opinions control you. Your cowardly diffidence, the tugs of conscious, conscience, are just wheels in the head. To use Max Stirner's happy phrase. And yes, um, if you read Max Stirner you can see how Marx and Nietzsche could be both relevant in their own way and with their own limitations. The most important thing, the most important topic when you philosophize is yourself, myself, the most cycle you're working on. I don't, and I say this elsewhere in the book, I don't see myself as an end in myself in sort of Kant's sense. I'm a means to an end. The point is that I'm motivated. There are things I want, want to do. And I'm honest with myself about what those are. I'm under no illusions about the sorts of opinions other people would express about it or what other people think of me. It really doesn't matter. Because I'm in pursuit of something that matters to me. And I'm sure that this that thought is in a lot of the minds of a lot of people who are motivated to do philosophy. But then they get sidetracked 
they find themselves in an institution where what really counts is the noise you can make or what other people think of you and there's always someone over you there's always someone who's in control there's always someone you have to please and that's sad it's very sad and I don't think it could be any other way I mean this is academia is that's what it is it's an institution and I guess I'm saying that it's not a good place to be a philosopher not really not ultimately that's my view but I will always remember the things I learned from Jerry and Ian I will always be sorry that their lives ended in the way that they did. There's nothing I can do to bring them back. But I would like them to be remembered. And there are a few people around, people who were in the department when I was there, who do remember them, which is good. I'll leave it there today. Thanks.